Okay, so in this set of slides, um, we're now going to discuss multi-arm bandits. And what we're going to see in a moment is that multi-arm bandits are really reinforcement learning problems with a single state. And you might ask, why should we consider such a simplified version of the problem? It turns out that there are very important industrial problems that can be um, formulated as multi-arm bandits, and in other words, as reinforcement learning problems with a single state. And there, what's the, the, the challenge is um, this notion of exploration versus exploitation. So, so this lecture is going to be dedicated to that problem, and then it's easier to understand how well to trade off exploration and exploitation when we simplify the problem, and in particular, if we just have a single state. Okay, so I'll, I'll explain in more detail again the problem of exploration and exploitation. Um, we'll see a measure of regret to evaluate how good are different algorithms to uh, perform exploration as well as exploitation. And then uh, we'll go into some more details about specific algorithms. Um, so one exploration strategy that we've already seen before is the Epson greedy strategy. So we'll go over that again, uh, but show um, more formally in terms of regret how well it performs. And then we'll discuss another important technique that is um, based on what is known as upper confidence bounds. Okay, so the exploration exploitation problem is a fundamental problem in reinforcement learning. And in fact, when you consider machine learning in general, um, like for supervised learning, unsupervised learning, there is no notion of exploration because you're given some data and then you're simply trying to uh, fit um, a predictor and, and that's it. Now in the context of reinforcement learning, what happens is that you get to be active in terms of, um, uh, well, whenever you select an action, you can think of it as like being the, um, the response to a state. So that could be, you can think of your action as, as almost like a classification or, or a prediction. But the, the issue is that this action will have an influence on the future. So it will have an influence in particular on the immediate reward, but also on future states. Now, if we consider just one state reinforcement learning problems, then these are known as bandits. And now we're going to see how uh, choosing an action, even though it might give us um, a way of, of um, uh, obtaining high rewards immediately, there's going to be a trade-off because I might want to do some exploration and perhaps once in a while select an action that is not very good just to see what will happen about this action and, and then gain more information. So, so, yeah, so in the context of reinforcement learning, this exploration exploitation problem is, is very important. And then, in fact, it is the problem in the context of bandits because here there is only a single state. And, and then um, it, it really what, what the challenge is, 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 is how should we explore so that in the long run we obtain a good policy. Okay, so let's um, define formally bandits. Uh, so here we'll talk about stochastic bandits. Um, so a stochastic bandit would be defined by having a single state. So I guess here the state space is trivial. There's, there's always just a single state and we're always in that same state. There's a set of actions. Now in the context of bandits, these actions are going to be often called arms. Uh, we'll, we'll see in a moment uh, why. So there's a metaphor. Um, and then the idea is that you could pull some arms that would correspond to different actions. And then uh, whenever you execute an action, you obtain some reward. The reward will be um, chosen by the environment from uh, some space. Now, it will often be convenient to rescale the space of rewards to be in the interval 0, 1. So we'll see in a moment why. Um, I mean, this is not a restriction per se because you can always rescale rewards without changing the problem. So if all of your rewards are multiplied by a constant uh, that is positive, then 
Uh, whatever action would be best is still going to be best after you've rescaled the reward. And same thing, if you add a constant to all the rewards, then it doesn't change the problem. Okay, so for bandits, the interesting part is as we saw, there's a single state, and if there's a single state and we're always in that same state, then there's really no transition function. Okay, so, so a major problem in reinforcement learning that we've been focusing on so far was this notion that, well, we, we, we don't have the transition function and, and we should perhaps estimate it or otherwise get samples about the trajectories to understand what kind of rewards we're going to obtain and, and, and so on. But in the context of bandits, it's a lot simpler because there is no transition. We're always in the same state. And, and really here, what we're going to focus on now is the fact that we want to learn a stochastic reward function. So the thing that is still unknown is, are the rewards that are, we're going to obtain as a result of each action. Okay, so this problem, um, the notion of bandit actually comes from gambling and in fact, um, here it refers to uh, this idea that we might have a row of slot machines and then these slot machines can be each thought as a one arm bandit. So I've got my slot machines here and then let's say that I go to a casino and perhaps the slot machines have different payoffs. Like usually in a casino, all the slot machines have the same payoff or at least they will advertise what the payoffs are and, and then it really doesn't matter which one you sit at. Uh, but, but then perhaps for somebody who's a little bit naive and, and maybe you know, doesn't believe that the slot machines all, pay, all have the same payoffs, right? Then, then you could decide that, okay, maybe I have to try these different slot machines and perhaps eventually sit at a good slot machine where I have a better chance of winning. Right? So, so the problem is essentially motivated uh, based on, on this scenario. And now, yeah, if you believe that the slot machines have different payoffs, then it's worth exploring, trying different machines until you figure out which one really has the best payoff and then play it uh, in, in the long run. Okay, so now slot machines are, are not anymore uh, the, 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 the main problem for, for bandits. Now, um, in practice, um, there's, there's all kinds of other scenarios where um, you can formulate the problem as, as a bandit. Uh, historically, an important problem was what they call design of experiments. Uh, so this is in, in health sciences, in biology, where perhaps you're doing some clinical trials. Maybe uh, you're designing a drug and then uh, you need to test this drug with different patients. And, and now you, you have, um, I guess, various parameters that you can tune for the drug and you're trying to figure out like maybe what's the right composition of different compounds to obtain the best uh, probability of, of, of a, a, a treatment being successful. So, so then you can formulate this as a bandit because then each time you uh, change a compound that corresponds to a different action and then you're going to uh, try this and observe whether the patient is cured as a result of that. Okay, And here you need to do some exploration. In fact, you could argue that what drug companies do uh, in general is a lot of exploration, real life bandits where they are uh, testing and exploring uh, what might be the best compounds to obtain optimal drugs. Um, okay, now uh, perhaps closer to everybody's lives. Um, uh, so whenever you go on the web, uh, an important problem is also online ad placement. And so in computer science, um, bandits became very popular when um, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, and other companies uh, started to optimize the placement of ads, and then they formulated this as well as a bandit problem. So we'll see in a more detail um, how to formulate this. But then, okay, a, a closely related problem is also web page personalization. So now there's a lot of interest on the web um, and, and, and in social media in general to offer services that are going to be personalized, right? So maybe um, for an app or otherwise a, a web page, uh, there's content that is displayed to a user 
And then this content, instead of being the same content that you would display to everyone, right, then you might want to tailor this content and, and show something that might be more relevant to different users. Like for instance, if it's a website about news articles, right, so each one of us might be interested in different topics, and then if the website can be smart and simply show you uh, news articles that, that you happen to care about, then you're going to stay on that website, read more articles and so on, and it's, and it's better overall. So, so at least in terms of personalized services, then um, these um, uh, bandits are a nice way of formalizing this, and, and in practice they, they are often used. Uh, same thing for games, so here you might, let's say you're in the design of, of uh, some video game and then uh, you're not sure how perhaps um, uh, to design different parts of the game, then uh, you can in fact um, experiment by uh, having uh, a certain version of the game tried with some users and another version of the game with other users and then see which uh, version seems to be uh, best appreciated by the players. And then so the, game, the gaming industry is, is also using bandits often to optimize various parameters inside games. Um, okay, and then in routing with networks, um, you can also uh, optimize the routes of packets uh, through bandits where the idea is that different routers are going to have to select perhaps different paths and then it might not be clear ahead of time which path is going to be most efficient because it, it might depend on, on the traffic, the level of congestion and, 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 and so on. And then uh, a simple approach is just to try and observe and then learn over time what might be the best path. I guess so, so as a result we can use bandits uh, to learn over time a good policy for routing. Okay, so let me come back to the online ad optimization problem. So here's a, a web page, um, and on this web page, you'll notice that there are various ads. So there's an ad right here, uh, there's another one here, and then there's another one here. Okay, so uh, most websites will have ads in different places, and then an interesting question is how how did the website decide which ad should be uh, shown to you? And, and you've probably had this experience where you go on the website and, and then maybe you have a friend beside you who also goes on that same website and you get different ads. And why is that, right? So part of it is that there's an optimization going on um, and then it can be formulated as um, a, a bandit problem. So in general here, uh, for this problem of which ad should be presented, the answer is that um, the website or otherwise the company behind the scene, which might be Google, Microsoft or other companies, um, they're going to try to select ads that are going to yield the highest payoff. And here the payoff is defined by the click-through rate times the payment. So here, the click-through rate is essentially the probability that a user will click on the ad, and then the, the payment is essentially uh, an amount of money that is paid by the advertiser whenever a user clicks on the ad. Okay, so, so that's roughly speaking the model. This was a model that was introduced by Google many years ago and has now become the standard uh, for online advertising. Okay, now, if you go ahead with this idea, the payment is obvious because the advertiser uh, has already uh, put in a bid indicating ahead of time how much he or she would pay if you click on the ad, right? So then there's going to be a payment triggered and, and then so that's already determined what that payment is going to be. But what is less clear is whether a user is going to click on the ad. Right? So, so this is where now for advertisers, what they'd like to do is, is try to optimize their revenue by showing ads that are as relevant as possible to users because if the ads are relevant, users are going to click on them and, and, and then it means that uh, the whole system is, is working well. But then we don't know what is the probability that somebody is going to click on an ad and this has to be estimated. 
So estimating this click-through rate can be formulated as, as a banded problem because here um, you, you need to experiment with different ads and observe how often people would click on them and then over time perhaps converge towards the ad that has the best click-through rate times payment. Okay, so here let's consider a simplified version of the problem where we're going to ignore payments or otherwise we're going to assume that the payments are always one unit whenever there's a click and zero otherwise when there's no click. Okay, so in practice the payment is not always the same, right? So it would depend on how much each company uh, is bidding for, 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 for their ads to be displayed, but for now because we just want to focus on the click-through rate estimation problem, right? Let's, let's just ignore the payment issue and let's just assume that it's one unit for, for all ads. Okay, so, so then um, we can formulate this as a bandit where the arms or the actions are going to be the set of all the possible ads and the rewards are going to be either zero for no click or one when there's a click. And, and then the idea is that we want to show ads that will maximize revenue and that really means ads that have the highest click-through rate possible. But the problem is we don't know what is that click-through rate and the only way of knowing this is that we have to show ads and observe over time what the click-through rate is. Uh, so here there's an interesting question about exploration and exploitation because you need to explore by trying different ads and that allows you to gather some statistics but then at some point you also want to start exploiting by just showing the ads that are going to be the most profitable. Okay, so, so the problem you see as I described it is, is extremely simple, right? But it, it, what's interesting at the same time too is that it has no tractable optimal solution. So, so it's a very difficult problem and now we're going to discuss uh, ways of, of tackling this using uh, reinforcement learning techniques uh, but then um, yeah there, there isn't um, while well, we there are ways of formulating optimal solutions but unfortunately they're, they're not tractable and, and they also rely on various assumptions that might not hold in, in practice. Okay so Let's start with a simple heuristic. Uh, so here, um, perhaps we can start with a greedy strategy where you show some ads and then at every step, um, you would essentially select the arm or the ad that has the highest average so far. The problem with doing this is that you might get stuck due to a lack of exploration, right? So you could imagine, let's say you've got two possible ads and then you show one ad to the first user, you show the other ad to the next user and perhaps the first ad somebody clicks on it, the second ad the person doesn't click. So now you could conclude that okay based on this the first ad was clicked therefore I'm just going to show this ad forever. But maybe here you were just lucky and then that ad was clicked by one person but then after that nobody cares about this ad anymore and then the click through rate might be very low. But maybe the ad that the first user did not click on was maybe the best ad and then in general there might be a higher probability so that's why you need to keep on exploring even though uh, at the beginning you might have some, some statistics that suggest that one ad is better than the other. Okay so if we need to explore um, a simple approach that we've discussed before is epsilon greedy where we're going to select an arm at random with some probability epsilon and otherwise we select the action greedily, uh, in other words the best action. Um, okay so this will ensure that there's some exploration but now the convergence rate uh, here how quickly we're going to discover the best ad or the best arm is going to depend on epsilon and then once we have discovered that best arm Right, then we'd like to just play it all the time so we don't want to explore anymore. So there's going to be an interesting question about how can we reduce um, epsilon so that uh, we don't end up paying a price for exploring too much. Okay, so if we want to um, evaluate 
algorithms in, in this context, a very useful tool is this notion of regret. So here I'm going to let R of A to be the unknown average reward of some action A. Um, so here again I assume that the rewards are stochastic. Now when I want to select different arms or different actions, I'd like to select the action that, that has the highest expected reward, so in other words the highest average reward, and I'm going to let R of A be this expected reward, so here this is going to be the, the true expected reward for action A. So then if I knew the true expected reward, it, the problem would be extremely simple. I would simply select the action that has this highest expected reward and we would be done. Right? So, so here uh, we would get an amount of reward I'm going to call R star, right? and this would be the highest possible reward on average that we would get by selecting the best action. Now unfortunately we don't know what is the true average for each action. So we're going to denote here uh, a notion of loss uh, for each action where we're going to compare its true average to the best average. Right? So R star is essentially the average of the best action. So let's define a loss function to be the difference between those two. Okay, so with this now um, we can talk about an expected cumulative regret. Um, well, okay, so yeah, the loss function, we're going to call it the expected regret because here we're comparing averages, so it's an expectation. And, and now, in, in general, we don't want to just look at, at the expected regret for one trial, but the expected regret over multiple trials. So here, let's say that I'm going to, to try actions n times then for each one of them there's going to be a potential loss and, and then my expected cumulative regret is going to be the sum of all those losses. Okay, so if we go ahead with the epsilon greedy strategy that we discussed before, um, and here let's say that we keep the exploration probability epsilon to be constant, then we can show the following. So when um, we've already experimented quite a bit, then we will have estimates that are fairly accurate for each action. And then at that point, we're going to select an action that is suboptimal with probability epsilon, and then that is optimal with probability one minus epsilon. Right? Because once I have experimented enough and I have good estimates of, of my rewards, then um, I can select, um, well, th there's going to be at any point in time a probability epsilon that I choose something at random and therefore I'm going to choose something suboptimal. And then with probability 1 minus epsilon, I'm going to choose the optimal action. So then, um, when this is the case, we can see that yeah, the probability at any point in time of choosing something that is suboptimal is, is epsilon. And now if, if we do this for n times steps, right, then I would sum this n times. And then overall, I would get a regret that would grow linearly. Okay, so here, when we evaluate algorithms, we'd like to see how much we're losing in comparison to an optimal policy that would always choose the best action. So regret is our tool to measure this loss with respect to the optimal action. And now we want to measure this loss or this regret over multiple time steps and see how this loss increases. Okay? Ideally, we want this loss to increase as little as possible indicating that we are going to be choosing optimal actions um, very often. But then in this particular case, right, at every step there's going to be a probability that's roughly epsilon. Once I, I know the, um, uh, once I have good estimates of, of the uh, expected rewards for each action. And then so over n time steps is going to give me um, an accumulated 
regret or cumulative regret that's going to grow linearly in M. Any questions regarding this? Yeah. I'm a bit confused. Like uh, here in the sum, you are computing the loss of A, right? N E A and T. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, shouldn't that be the probability that A T not equal to A star times the difference between the best reward and the reward at A T? It's room times the, the difference. Yes, you're right. Okay, so yeah, so it's epsilon minus the difference. Okay, so I guess um, here, let, let's go back. So you're right that I guess I, I should multiply by, by this difference, the loss. Now, if I go ahead with the assumption that all my rewards are rescaled between zero and one, right, then uh, the optimal reward would be one, and then the worst reward would be zero, right? So, so then here, uh, this loss, we could say that in, in the worst case, right, would be one. And, and then if it's not one, right, then there's going to be some loss that is going to be constant, okay? And so I guess, yeah, here perhaps what I should show is that, okay, I've got a probability of, of, of being suboptimal, that's epsilon, and, and then here I guess I should multiply epsilon by some other constant um, that corresponds to the actual loss. In the worst case, this actual loss is going to be one, um, with what I just explained, but otherwise it's going to be constant. And then if I just look at the overall trend, it's going to be something that grows linearly. Okay, but I, I guess yeah, I, I will revise the slides to indicate that yeah, there should be a constant here if we don't make this assumption that the loss is necessarily one. Good. Yeah. Uh, I, I still don't understand uh, that's the hall that's for the banding is because it has different displays for every time. So why it has only single single state? Uh, so so here, um, yeah, we're, we're assuming that there's a single state. Like in, in the case of um, let's say a web page where there's an ad being displayed, right? So perhaps that web page is the same each time, and it's just that we have different users that show up, and now we need to show an ad to those users, right? Yeah. So each time a user gets to that web page, right? Then we're in the same situation, same web page, and, and perhaps here, um, yeah, we, we need to simply pick an ad, so we always have the same state. So the state is the page, the web page? Yes. But, but how about the A's? A's is, uh, we, we look there as actions. Yeah, so the, the actions are the ads. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Now, okay, I guess what you're getting at, which we're going to cover uh, in, in a moment, is um, um, the notion of contextual bandits, where we could have uh, various states, and like for instance, if we have various web pages, um, then we might want to take into account various attributes of those web pages, and then share the experience of one page to help in terms of making prediction for another web page, and then, so the context is going to, to help us, um, uh, I guess, be more sample efficient. Um, and, and then we're going to have more than one state as a result. But for now, uh, the, the most basic definition of, of a multi-arm bandit is that there's a single state. Yeah. Okay, so... This is what happens when epsilon is constant, but now what if we choose epsilon to decrease, perhaps with a schedule where it decreases at a rate of one over t. Okay, so we've seen before um, in other contexts that uh, for reinforcement learning, when, whenever we're, we're doing some exploration and we're, we're let's say using this, this strategy of epsilon greedy, Right, then it, it will be important to decrease epsilon because otherwise we would keep on exploring. And, and since we keep on exploring, we always have um, a probability in the limit of making a mistake or at least choosing something suboptimal that is epsilon. But if we can decrease epsilon, then we're going to decrease the probability of making a mistake and then we could obtain better results. Right? So here, what if we decrease epsilon at a rate of one over t? So if we do that, then the probability 
that we make a mistake or that we choose something that is suboptimal in the long run is going to be roughly epsilon over t. So same as this epsilon here, but now epsilon over t is, is going to be 1 over t. So, so we're going to have a probability of being suboptimal that decreases. Okay, so this is good. And now if we look at the loss function um, that is a, a, a accumulated over n time steps, so the expected cumulative regret would be the sum of these probabilities times, uh, again, some um, constant that would correspond to the actual loss. Now, if I ignore that constant, uh, or otherwise, let's say I assume that this constant is 1, right? then I would simply have this sum. And now this sum in the limit um, will be approximated by the natural log of n. right? So, so this is a harmonic series. And then harmonic series have a growth uh, that, that um, asymptotically approaches the logarithmic function. In fact, here the natural log of n. So, so this is interesting because now when we compare those two, right, we have a regret that grows logarithmically versus here a regret that grows linearly. And in fact, whenever we've got a regret that is linear or perhaps even worse than linear, it means that we're not converging to the optimal policy. So we need a, a sublinear regret to obtain a policy that converges. And now we want to make it as small as possible because that will indicate that we're, we're converging as fast as possible. So here, a logarithmic regret, in fact, is a very good convergence rate. And, and, and it's been shown that uh, this is as good as it gets. So it's, so it's actually a lower bound. We can't do better than that. OK, so um, yeah, so here, um, I guess, yeah, we, we just saw how we could work with um, this epsilon greedy technique. Now let's consider another technique where perhaps uh, what we could do is simply estimate the rewards for each action. So compute an, an empirical mean and then see if we can select actions based on that. So this would be uh, the natural thing to do. Yes? Yeah, based on your argument in previous slide, if we, have, uh, if we decrease epsilon faster, we would get uh, better luck. Right, so if we decrease epsilon faster, then the probability of getting a loss uh, will obviously decrease faster. But now there's a risk where at some point, if we stop learning, because maybe we've decreased epsilon too quickly, right? then if, if we stop learning, then we might be stuck with a suboptimal action that looks like it's the best action. And then we would always incur a loss um, no matter what. So I guess here, um, yeah, this is, um, this is just an intuitive argument because there's this additional um, factor where you need to argue that here you will keep on learning forever because, yeah, if you stop learning, then as in stopping to explore, it might look like, oh, we, we don't have uh, any loss anymore, but no, we might have an important loss because we might just be stuck. So why doesn't this? Um, okay, so, so here uh, we don't have to worry about this because, um, yeah, I, I guess this slide is not as comprehensive as it could be, but there's some theory that shows that whenever you decrease epsilon at a rate of 1 over t, then you will uh, continue to, to explore. If you decrease at a faster rate, like 1 over t square, then, then this would not work. Uh, so we've seen before um, for exploration and, and also for learning rates that we need to have some schedules uh, where the sum of the learning rates um, would be infinite, but then the sum squared would be finite. And it's the same idea that applies here. Okay. Yeah. Um, this, so this is for rewards that do not discount. Right, so, okay, so here I did not include any notion of discount. 
Um, we could include some notion of discount, but usually in, in the context of bandits, um, yeah, we, we don't include discounts because I guess you have uh, a, a process that, 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 that repeats, but I mean, each time it's just like a one-shot decision, so you don't worry so much about the effect of what will happen in, in, in the future. Uh, but still, if you want, we could have a sum here that includes a, a, a discount factor. Yeah. Is that because we only have one state? Um, right, so I, I wouldn't say that it has to do with the fact that we just have one state. Um, it's just that here I, I, I was keeping the problem simple, so I just disregarded any notion of, of discount factor, but we could include a discount factor. So, well, I, I guess, yeah, okay, if, if we only have one state, then here what we can do instead is, if our process is infinite, we can consider just the average reward, right? And, and that, that's essentially the criterion that I'm using here. So I'd like to maximize the average reward. But if we have a discount, then we could maximize the average discounted reward, and, and then so, uh, R of A would not be just the average of all possible rewards, but it would be something that, that, that would decrease over time. Yeah. That's right. So yeah, so that's how I've, I've more or less defined this here, that epsilon t is uh, roughly the probability that we choose a suboptimal action. And, and okay, strictly speaking, when we talk about epsilon greedy, usually we say that with probability epsilon, we would choose an action at random. And now we need to specify what is the set of actions uh, among which we choose one at random. And here, to be more precise, I should say that we consider an action at random among the suboptimal actions. Because if you include the optimal action in here, then obviously the probability of choosing something that is suboptimal would be less than, than epsilon. Oh yes, oh yes, so yeah, here the greedy action, we're not certain that is the optimal one. So here, this is a simplified intuitive analysis where I'm saying in the limit, once I have already, uh, um, I guess, observed enough data, right, and I can have accurate estimates of the rewards for each action, then when I'm greedy, I, I am selecting the best action. So now, if I'm not in the limit, right, and I don't have accurate estimates, then when I'm greedy, I might select something that is suboptimal, and then as a result, the loss would be worse than that, okay? But this, this is an asymptotic analysis, right, where we wanna show how the um, cumulative regret would behave in the long run, Right, and then so in the long run, then we will have here accurate estimates, and that's why we can disregard the fact that really we would have here a probability that is higher because of inaccurate estimates. Here the greedy choice is the optimal. Yes, yes. Okay. All right, so, okay, if um, here we consider uh, a different idea where we would like to estimate rewards um, by simply considering the empirical mean, we could ask how far are we from the true mean? Um, and now if we knew some bound on uh, the difference between our empirical mean and the true mean, then perhaps we could simply select an arm that, is, um, that gives us the best combination of the empirical mean plus a bound because then this would tell us that 
uh, the true estimate would be necessarily less than that. Okay, so this, this is an, an, another approach that, that we could consider. Um, and, and now if we also assume that with additional data, we could refine this bound so that um, uh, it, it decreases and, and now our empirical estimate converges. Um, so then we would um, converge to the true estimate. Then we could define a different approach that would essentially select actions based on, on the bounds. So here there is a, 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 a general approach based on the principle of posit positivism in the face of uncertainty, where the idea is that at any step, we're going to assume that we have some oracle that can tell us about some upper bound on the true reward. And then we're going to select an arm based on, on this upper bound. So here, um, if the oracle indeed gives us an upper bound, and on top of that, as we get more and more data, the oracle is capable of refining this upper bound such that the upper bound converges to the true estimate, then we can have a simple algorithm that would just always select the action that, that has the best upper bound and, and go from there. So I guess yeah, this addresses the concern that Go Jung was uh, raising before where our estimates are not accurate. So on the previous slides when I was saying, well, we're just going to be greedy and select the action that looks best so far, right? So here I had to make this assumption that uh, we would have observed already enough data. But now another way of being greedy and, and to do something reasonable is to say, well, I don't know, I, I don't have an accurate estimate, but let me come up with an upper bound on, on what is the true uh, average. So here, I'm going to assume that I have an oracle that can give me such an upper bound. Let's assume as well that this oracle will improve over time. So as I get more data, right, then the oracle can refine this upper bound such that it converges to the true estimate. And then I could define an optimistic algorithm that will simply always select this upper bound, uh, at least select the action that has the highest upper bound because then if that action turns out not to be really optimal, then the upper bound will be refined and then it will converge in the limit to, to the true action. So this is a, a simple approach. Um, uh, that, that uh, can be used um, to um, do some exploration based on, on this notion of upper bound. But the, the problem is that here, this is not yet a, something realistic that we can use in practice because I'm assuming that I have an oracle that can give me an upper bound and the reality is that I don't have such an oracle. Okay, so now for now let's just assume that we we have such an oracle, then we could prove the following theorem where if we execute an optimistic strategy that always selects the best action based on the upper bound, then we will converge to the true action, or, or sorry, we will converge to the optimal action. Now the proof for this is very simple, so we can do a proof by contradiction, where here we're going to suppose that we converge to a suboptimal arm after infinitely many trials and then show that this leads to a contradiction. So, okay, here um, our upper bound after an infinite number of trials would converge to the true estimate for action A. And then if we've also tried action A prime an infinite number of times, then the upper bound for that would also converge to the true estimate. And now here A is better than A prime, so we have this inequality. And this is a contradiction because um, now we've assumed that we would converge to um, an action that is suboptimal, so we would have converged to A prime. But um, if we always select the action that has the highest upper bound, then we would essentially select in the limit action A. Okay, so this simple approach, right, um, of selecting 
the action that has the highest upper bound, we can prove that it will converge to the best action as long as we have an oracle that uh, can give us an upper bound that will be refined over time. OK, so now the problem is that in practice, we can't compute an upper bound with certainty. Uh, the issue is that you see here, we have to carry out some experiments. We have to try different actions and observe what the rewards are. So we're essentially getting some samples. And if we're getting some samples, there's always some probability that our samples are not really representative of uh, the, uh, the, the underlying distribution. And, and then as a result, we might be led in the wrong direction. And then so it, it's going to be difficult. In fact, it's impossible to get a, a true upper bound all the time. Now, what we can do in practice, though, is that we could come up with some measure f that is going to be an upper bound most of the time. Okay, so not all the time, because uh, here we were trying to estimate an upper bound based on some samples, but then those samples are stochastic, right? So they might lead us in the wrong direction. But most of the time, the samples are going to be representative of the underlying distribution, and then um, let's, let's use that to come up with an upper bound that holds most of the time. And what I mean by holds most of the time is that the probability that f of a is going to be greater or equal than r of a uh, will hold with probability 1 minus delta. Here delta is just going to be a small probability that, that we would make a mistake. Okay, so it turns out that we can define f based on Hovding's inequality. So Hovding's inequality is a famous inequality in, in, in probabilities and statistics, where here if we have a distribution, and then let's say we are looking at the mean of some random variable, and now we come up with an empirical estimate of that random variable, then we can form an upper bound. We can add to this empirical estimate an expression. I'll explain in a moment um, how we can use this expression. But in any case, there's a theory uh, about deriving this expression. Um, and, and then we can show that this upper bound will hold with probability 1 minus delta. Okay. So Hovding's inequality is essentially about coming up with this expression here. And this has to do with the variance of, of the distribution. Um, and what's interesting is that here in this expression, we have Na, which is the number of trials for arm A. Okay, so you can see that this term, which gives us the upper bound, will be decreasing as we increase the number of trials. Right, so, so if I execute, okay. <laughs> If I execute um, an, an action multiple times, then I should get an, em an empirical estimate that is better over time. And then I can get an upper bound that is tighter by allowing this additional term to decrease. Okay, so that's a nice property of this expression. Okay, so now we can define an algorithm called the upper confidence bound algorithm, or UCB. And then the idea is that in Hafting's bound, we're going to set delta n to 1 over n to the 4. So here, I'd like to have a bound. If I just go back, I want to have a bound that will hold most of the time, but I'd like it in the limit to hold all the time. So what I need is to make sure that this delta decreases. And perhaps we can make it decrease by simply setting that to 1 divided by n to the 4, where n is the number of trials that I've made. Okay? So as I experiment more and more with uh, my different arms, right, then n will increase. And then I will have a probability of making a mistake that decreases. Now if I plug this into Hafding's bound, I get the following expression. And now the idea is that I can go with this optimism in the face of uncertainty, where I'm going to select an action at every time step, 
that uh, simply has the highest combination of the empirical mean plus this additional term that gives me a bound. This bound does not hold all the time, but it holds most of the time. And, and then the idea is that in the limit, the bound will hold all the time because uh, this term will, will decrease. Um, and here, yeah, we, we have Na, which is the number of times that we select action A. So if we select action A infinitely often, right, then this, this will vanish, and then the empirical mean will be equal to the true estimate. Okay, so, so yeah, this is a, a simple algorithm uh, that works quite well in practice. And yeah, before I move on, any questions regarding this algorithm? Yeah. Right, okay, so yeah, so this is a, definitely a, a stochastic or probabilistic algorithm because it depends on the samples that we obtain. Those samples are going to give us uh, an empirical mean that might be accurate or not so accurate, and then we're going to come up with a bound that should hold most of the time but might not hold all the time. And then with a finite sample, right, then this will not necessarily converge to the true estimate. But if you have an infinite sample, then you can prove that this will converge to uh, the true estimate. And here, this would be a proof in probability. Yeah. OK, so yeah, here's a theorem that says that although Huffington's bound is probabilistic, um, the UCB algorithm will converge to the um, uh, optimal action. And I'm not giving you a, a formal proof, but just giving you an idea. The idea here is that as we increase n, the term that gives us the upper bound right, will increase. So this will ensure that um, actions that we're not selecting uh, will eventually have an upper bound that will increase. And then we're going to be forced to select them. So this will ensure that we try every action infinitely often. So you see, in this term, there's both n and na. n is the number of times that we select action a. n is the number of times that we select any action. Right. So as we select an action more and more often, then we become more and more confident in our estimate. So that's why this term decreases. But then when we select other actions, not A, but other actions, then N increases, but any does not. And then as a result here, this term will increase, and we will get um, an upper bound that becomes larger and larger and larger to the point where it should become larger than any other action that we've been executing, and then this action will get executed. So here, to normally to, to prove that an algorithm will converge to the optimal action, we simply need to argue that this algorithm will try every action infinitely often, which ensures that in the limit we're going to have accurate estimates. And this is guaranteed here by the fact that we have this n that increases. Okay. Yeah. So in practice, how do we know that it starts to Um, yeah, how do we know in practice that this converges? Um, in, in theory, it, it definitely converges, right? Right, so I guess, I guess you, maybe what you want to ask here is more like, in, in, in practice, how do we know that we actually have the optimal yeah. action, yeah. right? Because what, what, what we can show is um, the, uh, the, the average reward will eventually plateau. Right? And when it plateaus, then it means that it converges. But then maybe it plateaus at a level that is suboptimal. Right? And what we want to argue here is that it plateaus at a level that is optimal. Right? Um, 
So here, I mean, there's, I guess, I guess it's just based on the theory that we know that it will plateau at a level that is optimal. Um, now, I'm, I'm not sure, but I think it might be possible to argue as well that this algorithm, even though it's stochastic, when you look at the curve, um, okay, the curve is going to go up and down, but will generally have a trend, and then this trend will be something that is monotonically increasing. The problem is that in practice, because the curve is going to go up and down, right, it's going to be very hard to detect that, yes, we, we have converged. Yeah, so, so I guess, yeah, I, I, often the idea is that you just keep on executing this, right, for as long as you need to, and, and then it will ensure that you always improve and, and, and converge. Yeah. Okay, so this algorithm um, also has a, an expected cumulative regret that is logarithmic in n, uh, so this is very nice. And in summary, so here we've seen that uh, for stochastic bandits, the main problem is that there's an exploration exploitation trade-off. And then we discussed so far two algorithms. The first one was epsilon greedy. The second one is UCB. In both cases, we can obtain a logarithmic expected cumulative regret. In the case of epsilon greedy, we need to decrease epsilon at a rate of one over T. Um, so in theory, both of them have a similar convergence rate. Now in practice, it turns out that UCB often performs better than epsilon greedy, and the UCB algorithm that I described is, is one of the most basic UCB algorithm. Now there's lots of other variants that will try to improve further uh, the convergence rate. I mean, asymptotically, it doesn't change, but the idea is that if you can still uh, approach this asymptote more quickly, right, then uh, at least for a finite sample, it, it might be better. So a lot of those other algorithms that are variants of UCB uh, in practice can, can improve uh, this basic algorithm. 